Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Atsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am Tracy Otsuka, and I wanted to welcome you to episode 111 of ADHD for Smartass Women. Before we start, before I introduce our lovely guest, I do want to remind you about my free five-day workshop called How to Fall in Love with Your ADHD Brain. You can go to tracyoutsuka.com forward slash I love my brain to join the wait list. So let's start. In this episode, I am going to introduce you to Dr. Diana Mercado. Dr. Mercado is the daughter of Mexican immigrant workers. She graduated from St. Mary's University in San Antonio with a Bachelor of Science in Biology and Chemistry. She earned her medical degree from the University of Texas and did her residency at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. Dr. Mercado became a family medicine physician so that minority patients could feel like they could trust a physician who, in her words, looks like them. Today, Dr. Diana Mercado is a nurse practitioner mentor, a clinical medical director, and she was just elected chief medical officer for Jackson County Hospital in Texas. Diana, welcome. Did I get all that right? You sure did. So how does it feel when you hear me saying all these things that you've accomplished? I'm wondering who you're talking about. (laughs) You know, we all do things. And we have big dreams, but when you look back, you sometimes surprise yourself that you actually accomplished them, you know, Um, because most of us just do things on a day-to-day basis and we just keep jumping the hurdle a day at a time and then it adds up, you know, it really does add up. So let me ask you this question, which I don't think I've asked anybody else this before, So you didn't secretly always have this sense that you were meant to do big things, that you're going to do something major with your life. Have you ever had that sense or no? Are you kind of like in shock that you have accomplished as much as you have at this point in your life? No, I mean, I'm kind of in shock, really, because, you know, I just never thought that I would get to where I'm at. And even though I have accomplished it, like it still doesn't really feel like a big deal. It feels like I worked hard at it, but then I look around me and I'm like, well, isn't everybody doing the same thing? Like (laughs) it doesn't dawn on you that I guess I have accomplished something kind of cool and kind of great that not everybody can accomplish. But I think because I didn't know that I had ADHD until later in life, actually in my first semester of medical school, I think I just knew I had to work harder than everybody else. And I knew that I was going to do whatever it took to get what I wanted 
which was to graduate from college and to, you know, one day become a doctor to be able to provide help for people who didn't speak English or people who didn't trust or people who thought that they just needed to use an egg to get better, you know, run it over your face and you would be okay instead of using <laughs> antibiotics, you know? So those were my, my tias, you know, those were my aunts thinking those things and obviously delaying the proper care, you know? So, yeah, I think the fact that I didn't know I had ADHD just kept me going. But I mean, if you look back, it was always obvious that I had ADHD. I mean, my parents had to go and sit there in classes so that I could stay still on my seat. (laughs) Because I guess I had the impulsiveness of it, but I was also the, in the subjects that I loved, I would hyper hyper focus and I would finish my stuff and then the teacher would give me more work and I would finish that work and then it was just like okay well we don't know what to do we're just gonna bring the parents in you know so was it Diana were you a really smart I mean I hate to use the word smart because what does smart even mean today right we're smart in so many different things and I think that's our charge as women with ADHD is figure out where our brilliance lies because we all are brilliant at something. So I guess my question is, were you good at school? Was that easy for you? And it was more just you couldn't sit still and you were disrupting other kids? Or what did your childhood look like? So my parents, like you you mentioned, were immigrant workers. Like we actually grew up in Mexico till I was 10. And so obviously Spanish was my primary language and my only language till I was 10. But I was born in Texas because my parents were given, I guess, passes to come and work in the fields in different states, like in California or like Washington State to pick produce certain seasons. Mm -hmm. And so one of the days, or I guess I, on the way back to Texas, I was born, you know? And so that's how I was born in Texas. But I grew up and all I knew was, you know, Mexico and that's what I did. And so I came and I started in my, in second grade, I was supposed to be a third grader, but because I didn't know English, I had to do the English as a second language Mm -hmm. and math was so easy because of course I like you can look at the numbers and you can... It's universal, right? Right, exactly. You can figure out division or addition or whatever. So that was like super easy for me. But like, I remember one of the first actual words that I learned, I would hear like the announcements being made over the intercom and they would keep talking. They were giving a sentence and they would use the word also which in Spanish sounds like bears or is bears, you know? And so I would keep looking around when I would hear the announcements and I'll be like, where are the bears? Like, I was so shocked that there was no bears coming in, but they would keep using that word over the intercom. And so it was so interesting to learn English. I wanted to learn English and I would stay after school and like, you know, do all that I could. So I did second and third grade English second language, fourth grade, I only did it for six weeks. And then they were like, no, she's scoring better than some of the kids here. We need to promote her. (laughs) Yeah. So they bumped me up to fifth grade and then I was put in all the gifted classes, but still like I, I was so, so it was such a thing because the stuff that I didn't like, or I guess things, it's not that I didn't like it, but like, I couldn't remember to turn in the assignment that I actually did, you know, like the ADHD and you where you did it, but you don't know where you left it or, and so I, (laughs) so my mom's like, I saw her do it. And and then they would ask me questions and I would answer. I was like, yeah, I did do it. They're like, well, where is it? I don't know. You know? So it was just one of those. You still find it. (laughs) I know. I'm like, I did it. How come it didn't get here? So it was just one of those things that I was not organized. Like I just was not organized. But I would do the work. And I mean, if they would put me to do it there, I would do it in five minutes. And they're like, well, why didn't you turn it in? You just did it in five minutes. I'm like, I don't know. So it it got to where my mom really helped me as soon as I would get home. She would be like, okay, we're sitting down. 
we're not moving until you do the work and we put the work back in your backpack and I'm in the morning I'm gonna make sure you have your backpack so like she made me make like education like a priority and like the first thing I would do before I would even eat or go out to play and so that I think helped me and I guess back in the days we didn't realize that I mean I was she thought I was just a you know, crazy kid like everybody else. And it never even came up that I might have something going on because I guess I was excelling in the grades and I even skipped and got back on track, you know, for a different new language, right? So that kept going. And then in high school, everything was fine. I I, I was even shocked when they told me I was a junior in high school and they're like, you know, you're number two out of like 700 students. And I was like, huh? What has everybody else been doing? Like, I just been doing my work and I, I was kind of shocked that I was up there. And so, yeah, like it surprises you because I did so well in school. And of course, I did get myself in trouble where I would like forget my name badge when I went to work or I would be wearing like a different pair of socks or I would show up at the different day <laughs> that I was off at work, you know, like silly, stupid things, you know, always late, always, always late, always interrupting my friends when they were talking, because if I didn't tell them I was going to forget, it's like I had diarrhea of the mouth, you know? <laughs> so it, it's like, but my friends just knew that I had like my best interest, like, and, and like, I ended up making like the varsity team of like the cross country team, not because I was fast, but but because I was the only one like passing the classes. So they're like, well, <laughs> you know, here you go, you get promoted. You know, I was like, but I'm finishing, you know, way last. They're like, who cares? You showed up to every single practice, you're passing, you're showing up, you know? So that taught me like lots of lessons. Like you just keep showing up. Yeah. And that's ADHD, right? We are just so, oh my gosh, what's the word? We just don't give up. I can't think of the word, but we just don't give up. We've, we're tenacious. Right, right, right. And I think when ADHD people, but women, because that's who we're talking about here, when we struggle is when we give up on our tenacity. Because like you just said, when you just did your work every single day, all of a sudden that added up over, you know, the year or the years into something pretty substantial if you're number two out of 700 kids in the school. Right. You were never disruptive. You were just disorganized. And that's where you would get yourself into trouble. Yes. And it makes sense, I guess, because you performed so well, you know, you, you got these incredible grades. Clearly, they saw you were smart. And that's when a lot of us fall through the cracks, right? It's the smart ones, because especially the ones who aren't causing trouble. <laughs> right, right. So all your life, you had these little markers of ADHD, but you didn't know that it was ADHD. And so would you beat yourself up about it, that it was a character flaw, it was a moral failing? Or did you know there was something else going on? No, I mean, honestly, I had no idea. Like, I just thought I was a klutz, you know? <laughs> I just thought, well, all I would say is like, well, it's another day in Diana's life, you know? Like, well, I wasn't surprised. Like, of course, I would get other people at annoyed at me you know and and I was just like well whatever what do you want me to do is I'm not doing it on purpose like <laughs> I'm trying but I don't do it on purpose and I had no idea honestly I was so oblivious because I just thought okay well whatever I'm just a little absent-minded I lose my phone you know multiple times a year like I don't know where my keys are all the time like they should put a chip on it or something you know like I never thought it was my fault and I never realized that sometimes if you do routines or do things like that, that might be helpful and you might help yourself, you know, and I was always late because I'm running around looking for the shoes or looking around for the keys or whatever, you know. So and I just thought that's the way I was. I didn't think anything of it. I was like, well, whatever. Life balances out, you know. But yeah, I had no idea. Did I mispronounce your name? Is it Diana or Diana? I didn't even think to ask about that because, you know. Diana. Diana. Oh, my gosh. Diana Mercado. Okay. I am so sorry about that. So 
it sounds like you didn't really beat yourself up about it. It was more like, well, that's just the way it is. And you just kept your head down and kept going. Yes. I love to hear that. I love it. Okay. What was it? Your first year of medical school? Is that what you said when you were finally diagnosed? Yes, it was my first year of medical school. And again, I was oblivious to this, that there might be something else, right? Like I was totally oblivious to it. It was actually one of my good friends that I was studying with for all the medical tests that she said to me, I think there's something wrong. And I said, what are you talking about? And she says, I see that you're clearly studying like 80 to 90 hours. And like, I don't see anybody else studying that many hours. And I see you here in front of me studying. It's not like you're making it up or I'm exaggerating it. And I see that you catch some things that you're reading, but I see that you don't catch a lot of stuff. Like, and that, I don't know if that's normal. Did this friend know about ADHD when she talk to you about this or was she just telling you there's something not right here? So I think she might have brought up the ADHD. She said, I think there's something wrong. She's because she also was Hispanic. She's like, I don't know if it's because, you know, English is your second language and you're maybe just not understanding what you're reading. Or I don't know if maybe you have a learning problem now that you have to read so much Or I don't know, because she said sometimes when I would talk, like I would say something that I didn't even realize I said, like I was swapping words or something like I would Mm -hmm. or I wouldn't remember. Like I would I would say, well, that thing over there, because I couldn't remember the thing. And so I had to say the thing, you know, I couldn't remember what I was trying to tell her. So so she says, I don't know if it's just like you're so tired that you think that by studying more, you're over studying or if you have some type of problem, like you just can't concentrate. And so I would take my tests and like, I have to back up here. So my first semester was stressful, okay? My father got diagnosed with stage four cancer. Oh. And I didn't know, like when, when he got diagnosed, like it was, it was bad. Like they told us, oh, he might have two or three years to live. Uh, sorry, mm. two or three months, months to live. So I didn't know what two or three months meant. So what I started doing was I would fly home, which was to South Texas, and it was just a 50-minute like flight. But if I drove, it would be a seven-hour drive each way. So I mm-hmm. would just fly. Like as soon as Friday classes were done, I would fly home. And then uh, Monday, like 5 o'clock, I would be flying back and going back to class, you know, so it was stressful. And so I don't know at that point if it was because I was worried about my father or if it was because I was anxious, because in my mind, like I'm a first generation college student and in medical school, my God, it was like a dream. Like all my family is looking up to me to like be successful because I'm I was the first one to get there. So I don't know if I was putting like pressure on myself to like perform and like in my mind, like if I didn't pass the test, then I was letting everybody down. So it was such a pressure. And so they're like, I don't know if you're not doing well on your test because you're putting that pressure on yourself or because you're being anxious and you can't concentrate or because you just don't finish your test because if they were to look at them, but whatever I did answer, most of it I got right. And and I just couldn't get to like one third of the test. Like I just never mm-hmm. got to it because I would run out of time. Mm-hmm. And so again, my friend finally said, you need to go get tested, see what's going on. Because if you have anxiety, maybe you can take some meds and then you can be relaxed and then you can finish. Or if there's something else, then they can figure out if, you know, maybe get a tutor or get whatever, you know? And so finally I went and I got my uh, physician recommended I go get like this four hour test. Um, Mm -hmm. It was so extensive. And then they ended up telling me that I did have ADHD. And again, I was still like, huh, what? What are you talking about? (laughs) And so they said that 
I was at that point like two years behind with my like English, like if I were, uh, you know, based on all the schooling I had done, I because English was a second language, they said that English was something that was preventing me. And so that they gave me some things for me to, some voc- dictionary for me to learn more English words, because maybe I wasn't understanding what they were asking for the questions. But then they also decided that I should start on medication. And oh my God, when I started on medication, it was like the world just like slowed down. Like all of a sudden I could like focus on one thing at a time. Like I didn't have like five different tabs open. Uh, (laughs) When I would start reading something like that would trigger me some other thought. Oh, I wonder if this is connect. And then here I was like, (laughs) yes, yes, like jumping from here to there to there. And like, then I forgot what I was reading. So then I would start reading again. But what I realized and what they pointed out to me from that test is that the way I took information was spatially. So if I did my notes and like putting like all these are alike group and all these are different or these two are combined, then my brain, when I was taking a test, could see the space like where Mm -hmm. I put it and then I could answer the question. Or if I looked at the picture, like before I even started reading, like the way, you know, something was drawn out, then it made sense because I was just a visual learner. Like I couldn't you know, retain everybody talking, I would just get glimpses here and there. But when I would actually look at the pictures, it would help. But the medication did like wonders to like, I, like I was saying, one thing. Was at it a literally time. the first time, Deanna? Yes. Yes. What were you, what did they put you on? So they, so, you know, back in the day, I didn't even, it was Ritalin. They put me on five milligrams. That's like a baby dose for a kid now. Yeah. I didn't even know then. Um, and it was such a difference, but I would, but it would start to like wear off. And I was like, I would go and tell them, well, I can study, but I can't study that long. Like, I think there's something wrong. And I, and I, then I started like blaming myself because how come it work for a few hours? And then like, I was starting to like beat myself up that it wasn't mm-hmm. working unaware that it was working the way it was supposed to. But I will tell you when I got diagnosed, like, you would have thought that that would have made me feel relief. Like, okay, finally, that makes sense why I've been doing whatever I've been doing. But it actually brought like a huge shame yeah. because because in my mind, I was the oldest one. I was supposed to be the example. And it made me, it made me feel broken. Like everybody was going to now know that I wasn't perfect. And, you know, for some reason I was making perfection mean like that would equal love or worthiness, you know? Yeah. Because I, I don't know why I was making that mean, you know, but with time. And so then I always had this like, oh my God, everybody's going to find out I have ADHD. They're not going to like me or like, I felt like an imposter. I always felt like an imposter because I I had this loop that was telling me that ADHD meant not being good enough, not being, you know, it, I don't know. It was a mic, it was a wire that now I know that that was not a way to think about it and that mm-hmm. ADHD was obviously what got me to where it got me because I just didn't accept no for an answer and I didn't <laughs> I didn't care that I had to have an A through C plan until I got to whatever plan I needed you know I just knew I had to work harder and I was eventually gonna get it you know and so I knew you- that I had to seek support like I knew if I and I did I, if I had to have three tutors and meet with them like two or three times a week I did that like I was gonna do whatever it took to get to the end result because I started to know that if I showed up for somebody else I was gonna be prepared to not waste that person's time because they're giving me their time and so that forced me or encouraged me to <laughs> show up for myself but sometimes you don't show up for yourself you show up for others and so 
I guess like with time, um, you know, so being on the medications, they eventually got me to the long acting medication, a Concertac, which is the same medication as Ritalin, but it's just a long acting form of it. And that they put me on like 18 milligrams and then they gave me the five milligrams um, like for me to use as needed daily whenever I was studying or having to do a project or whatever. And that worked great. I used that for all of my medical school for my residency. Once you kind of got your medication stable, were you still working the 80 to 90 hour weeks or what did that look like then? No. So I think it probably went closer to like 60 hour weeks. Mm -hmm. And I finally started sleeping more. I felt calmer. Like I started exercising. I bet you felt like you had so much free time. Yeah. It was so weird. I was like, oh, is this how people feel like? (laughs) Where have I been? Like, I just knew it had to work harder. So that just what had to be done. Like I never questioned why, you know? Yeah. So do you have siblings? Yes. I have a sister and a brother and uh, we're each four years apart. And are either of them ADHD? So they have never been formally diagnosed, but Mm -hmm. I'm surprised they haven't been (laughs) diagnosed. (laughs) (laughs) And what about with your parents? I'm pretty sure my mom has ADHD. I mean, I just think we were just not aware that this was something Mm -hmm. that, you know, I I just think, I mean, you look around and you can see all, probably all our family has ADHD, but so that's why we just thought, well, it's norm, you know, it's the norm. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, I think most immigrants do, right? I mean, it takes some real cojones to <laughs> to decide you're going to uproot the whole family and you're going to move to a, you know, a different country. So it makes sense to me. Yeah. So what has changed since you were diagnosed? I mean, you told us, you know, about medical school became much easier, right? You're now working 60 hour weeks. Was there anything else? Yeah. So one of the things that So I took my meds all the way until I finished my residency. And then I had an encounter with a physician after Mm. I finished my residency. My my psychiatrist told me, you need to go be seen by another psychiatrist because I only work, you know, in in this setting, which is only for students. And now you've graduated. So now you, you're you considered, you know, a physician in attending. You need to be seen by somebody else because I only work in this setting. So, you know, now you have your insurance and a new insurance because I'm now at my, at my first job. And I just picked a random person from the list of the psychiatrists that took my insurance, not really researching the physician or anything. I, it was just a psychiatrist. And I went and I took him my four-hour test and I took him my two bottles that I was of the medications I was on. And he was maybe there with me in that encounter for three minutes. Like I told him that I was th- that I was a physician and that I was excited to start practicing and that I wanted to get my medications refilled and that, you know, this were my records so I could establish care with him. And he looked at me and he said, you should know better. You are a physician. You should know you outgrow ADHD as an adult. Oh, what year was this, by the way? This was 2013. Oh, my gosh. So not that long ago. No. And so when he said that, oh, and then he walked out. (laughs) When he said that, of course, my thought was, I should know better. So you believed him? Yeah, I believed Mm -hmm. him. Like, Mm -hmm. that, like, caused even more shame and more like, oh my God, like the specialist just told me I should know better. Like what the hell, you know? And Mm -hmm. so because of that, because I was shaming myself, 
I started ignoring that I had ADHD. Like I just let it go, you know? And so for all these years, I just said, I just ignored my self-care. You know, I just said, whatever, I'll just keep working harder. And so I lived for years coping without medications. Mm. But the last six months, because probably the pandemic, you know, and probably because life finally gets you to where you're like, oh, my God, I can't keep going like this. (laughs) You start wondering, like, if there's a better way, you know. And now if I were to relive that episode, my thought would be, I should know better. I do know better. He just met me. He just got a glimpse of me for three minutes. He doesn't know what it's like, what I've been living with. It's not about me. It's about him. Maybe he's just not comfortable with having professional adult ADHD people. Like, it's not about me. I should have done my research. I should have gone to a psychiatrist who knows that there's ADHD professionals who are doing just fine. And so now I would have known that I'm worthy. I would have done something else differently had I known what I know now. And this is the funny things about our brain, right? Like we're always our worst critic. Like we tell ourselves things that we wouldn't even tell like somebody who we just met. Like we have more compassion towards other people than we do to ourselves. And, and there's a reason for that. Like, you know, our, if you think back or ancestors, like they had to run away from the bear, right? Otherwise they would be getting eaten, you know? <laughs> Mm -hmm. And they had to learn to be people pleasers because otherwise, if the tribe says you're going to like get kicked out of the tribe again, your life is in danger. So our brains are conditioned to think of the worst case scenario so that it's trying to protect you and tell you nobody else can hurt you. Like you already thought about all the possibilities or you already told yourself all kinds of stuff. But we all know that nobody performs at the top of their game when they feel ashamed or embarrassed or whatever. And so I did the best that I could all through medical school because I didn't know any better. I wasn't making, I didn't even know I had ADHD. I didn't even know there was something wrong with me. I just thought this is life, you know? And then when I got diagnosis, I made it seem something that was a wrong thought that obviously didn't serve me or hadn't served me, you know? So in the last six months, I've started to, and and I've been listening to your podcast on and off for the last year, but really in the last six months, I really started to listen to your podcast a lot more on my way uh, to work. I have a 30 minute commute each way and I I have a two and a (laughs) three-year-old I really thought that the pandemic just like broke me. You know, I started to feel like burned out. Like I started to feel like, like, what is this? What's the point? You know? And then I started to, to question, is there something I can do about my ADHD? Is there something I can do to help myself, to empower myself? You know? So I hired an ADHD coach. Mm -hmm. And I started to figure out how to implement routines to support my style of, of thinking and my style of getting stuff that I wanted to done to be done. So I think I discovered that self-care was very important. And I wasn't even aware that I wasn't making like my own list. Like I would give away to everybody like my time, but I wouldn't make time for myself. And it was because I was thinking that I was already like half-assing everything. Like I was a half-ass mom, a half-ass wife, half-ass doctor. Like I, so I was like, I don't have time like for anything else. I'm barely doing half of what I should be doing. So how am I going to do like time for myself? Like such a weird thinking, even though I'm a family physician and obviously every day I'm talking about taking care of yourself. Right. But 
<laughs> it's like it's like I'm talking to them about exercise and eating well, but yet like I didn't realize that I was eating everything under the sun because I was buffering, you know, instead of like I was trying to find that dopamine, but I was finding it a wrong way, you know? Mm -hmm. And so not until I finally like found some article that talked about high achievers with ADHD and it talked about having like four characteristics that said that they tend to have unique talents and interests and they can do well in school and they just work harder and they seek help. Like it just dawned on me that there is a unique set of us who are high achievers and are professionals and we get missed because we just assume that they're doing well. But if you keep asking me, how does your house look? You, you'd be like, oh God, how are you a doctor? <laughs> like, you know, like <laughs> they'll be like, this is a mess. Like you, you have clutter. Like I, I didn't have any routines for dishes. It was just crazy, you know? And I didn't think that was a problem because I thought, well, my life is meant to be chaotic. Like I didn't realize I was leaving from a place of reactiveness versus a place of intention. I didn't realize that things would be different if I put myself at the top. I didn't realize that that was not selfish, that I didn't realize I could just ask my husband, hey, can you watch the kids for like 30 minutes so I can go for a run? And he would say, yes, like, I didn't think I could do that. <laughs> so, so silly, right? Like, do not even be aware that you could do that. So once I started doing that, that started changing. Like, little by little, I started to question myself and my beliefs and whether I had beliefs that were actually serving me or not serving me, or was I making wrong connections, you know? And so the impulsiveness of ADHD, um, one day in, I think it was September, I was listening to a podcast. So of course I listened to lots of podcasts and I jumped from one to another to another. So I listened to one podcast. It was Brooke Castillo's, uh, the doctor panel. And on there were five physicians talking about how they had gone through life coach school and how they had realized that we're all human and, you know, that we don't have to ask permission to go to the restroom. Like you should just go to the restroom, you know, silly things like that. And so that day I signed up for, <laughs> yeah, that same day, like I signed up. Because you didn't course. have enough to do, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> And, and I have to tell you, it makes me laugh because you talked about, oh, you just felt like you weren't cutting it and you thought it was the pandemic and just life and being a doctor, but you forgot to mention that you had a two and a three-year-old. Yeah, that would do it. <laughs> and then now life coaching school. <laughs> yes. I love it. Yes. So I signed up for that uh, program that was called Empower Women Physicians, and it was a two-month program that got me to realize that it's our thoughts that can lead to our actions or inactions. And then mm -hmm. that can then lead to results. And honestly, when I signed up and I did the questionnaire, like in my mind, like there was nothing wrong. Like life was supposed to be chaos. Like there was nothing wrong. This is just Diana's life. Like that's the way it is. Like there's nothing wrong. But the more that I talk to other people, the more I started to implement things for myself, like exercise and running and uh, Zumba and eating well and planning my food and different things like that. But still, I didn't think it was enough. Like, and then I went to some course. Um, it's like the universe finally sent me all the messages or maybe they were always there and I just didn't want to see them because I wasn't ready to hear them, you know? So I was doing my... Um, AAFP, which is the American Academy of Family Physicians. And usually uh, it, it was a virtual event, of course. And, and they had like, you know, something crazy, like 120 lectures. But there was only one lecture that was two hours long. And that lecture was adult ADHD. <laughs> wow. So I was like, okay, again, the universe is telling me things. So I went to that lecture. And then I was just shocked because one of the examples that they gave was about a lady who seemed to have 
everything okay on the outside, like professionally, but then again, everything was a mask when it came to her personal life or, you know, or always tired or whatever, you know? And so I was like, oh, that kind of sounds like me. And then they talked about how medication helped her get better. They did like a one month, three months, five year, 10 year, 20 year, and how they kept changing the meds and how she felt so much better. But I think the takeaway point from that particular lecture was that some of us might die in an accidental death, mm -hmm. like 21 years earlier than somebody who dies from yes. a natural cause. Yes. And so that shocked me because they said that most of the time those accidental deaths could be due to our inattentiveness or impulsivity, mm -hmm. especially when we're driving, right? And so then that study was from a, a Swedish study. And like, it shocked me because like I drive back and forth, like with my kiddos, you know, an hour a day. And then I was like, oh, my God, I need to do something about this, like not seeking help. And it didn't have to be necessarily medications, but not it could have been like talking to a psychologist or talking to a psychiatrist or getting an ADHD coach. Like it doesn't matter how you seek help. But if I didn't seek help, like that could be just as bad as if I were to be smoking, you know, and I don't smoke. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I really thought that I needed to do something about it. And so I just happened to text one of my psychiatry friends that I always send uh, things to uh, patients to. And she was like, yeah, of course, I'll talk to you. And she started me on a, on a new medication about two months ago, I would say two or three months ago. And it's called Mydeas, which is amazing. I'm on the lowest dose of it. It stays with you like 16 hours. So I take it like at six in the morning and I don't even fear it wear off, but I have actual energy to spend time with my kiddos when I do get to work. And once the kids go to sleep, like, but yeah, I didn't, not until I started on meds and setting up all these routines. Okay. My kids would be crazy. Okay. They wouldn't go to sleep till like midnight and yes. And then they would be up by five. So then you could just imagine how, I'm pretty sure they probably have ADHD just like me, but you know, <laughs> you could just imagine like that. Finally, I had to learn like, no, like you're the parent, like you set routines for them. Like, and I started giving them melatonin. I was like, we're going to sleep. You're going to sleep. It's going to be nine o'clock. That's what the time you're going to sleep because mommy has to sleep. <laughs> so, you know, finally, now I've realized that there's nothing to be ashamed with with the diagnosis of ADHD, that I'm very grateful that I got diagnosed and that it, it took me a while to realize that there are so many unique things that are could be your superpowers because of it and that using everything, exercise, eating well, you know, meditation and medications, like when you put all those things together can really make a big difference in my life. And like my husband has said that like he's seen me the most happy he has ever seen me. And, and it's just like, who am I? You know, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so Deanna, do you think that there are ADHD traits that make you a better doctor? Yes, I think I can talk to them without being judgy. I just listen, which is weird because I told you I have diarrhea of the mouth. So you can just imagine <laughs> what that conversation is like back and forth. But I think it helps me because, you know, ADHD, you can get bored if it's over and over the same thing. But with family medicine, like, I don't know what's going to come in through the door. Like, I don't know if it's a newborn who just, you know, uh, I don't know if it's a child who just had an ankle sprain. I don't know if it's a teenager who's like worried about their weight or depressed. I don't know if it's, uh, you know, somebody who's starting birth control. Uh, I don't know if it's like a 90 year old who's concerned about dementia. I, I, like, I don't know what my day is going to be like. So, it doesn't let me get bored, you know, 
So I'm able to jump from being at the hospital and then being at the clinic and then being at the nursing home. And because it keeps changing, like I really need to be careful because I mean, there's still times that sometimes I show up at the wrong place. I'm like, oh, it wasn't today. Like, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I mean, it still happens, but I try really like hard to, to know. So I think understanding what it's like and how hard I had to work when people come in for anxiety I'm not just gonna give them a diagnosis of anxiety like I really take my time to figure out is this depression is this insomnia is this ADHD you know Mm -hmm. you'd be surprised how many people get diagnosed now because I'm aware of it right later in life and then they're like doc I didn't even realize and 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 now because of the work that I've done on me I tell them I have ADHD too (laughs) and they're like what I'm like yes (laughs) well and that is so important that there is no longer the shame you're out there you're a role model they can see well she's a doctor I have ADHD too. I can be a doctor or whatever I want, whomever I want, right? Exactly. Yes. Yes. And and, and you know, it's so weird because intellectually, I don't think ADHD is any different than high blood pressure or diabetes or cholesterol. Like I wouldn't like blame the patient because they have any of those conditions that can also sometimes be hereditary, right? Um, And I wouldn't see them as any different, like if they did have ADHD. But for myself, I was like making it mean all kinds of drama, you know? And now I realize that that was just the faulty thought. And I don't have to hold on to that thought because that thought is not serving me, you know? And now, like I said, I do feel grateful that I have the diagnosis and that I have been able to be courageous enough to seek for help because, and that's what I want to say, like, you know, if somebody doesn't understand you when you go ask for help, like, just go to a second counselor, go to a second physician, like, don't give up on yourself. Like, if you know there's something that you're struggling with, like, you need to, you know yourself, you need to advocate for yourself so that you can get the help that you need. Absolutely. And trust yourself. I mean, what I have noticed is when we believe that it's something, when we believe, no, it's ADHD, we just kind of know it, you know? And so I think in most cases, you're right. And you need to, like you just said, keep advocating. Don't listen to what that physician, you know, said to you that, oh, you just outgrow it. And, you know, don't you know that? Or the um, psychologist who told uh, my husband and I that our job was to just reduce my son's expectations because, you know, otherwise he'd be disappointed in life. I, I completely agree. And so I have to ask you, did you ever call that physician back or write him a letter and tell him, you don't know what the hell you're talking about? (laughs) No, I don't even remember his name. (laughs) I'm telling you, it was like a three minute encounter if that, Mm. (laughs) but yeah, I'm pretty sure, you know, if he were to look at me now, I'll be like, what were you saying? (laughs) Who doesn't know what they're talking about? (laughs) Can I also ask you in the Mexican community, is ADHD one of those things that uh, it's not, you know, it's not really, there's no such thing as ADHD. Was that part of your experience or no? So here's the thing. I don't know if my my family ever even realized that we had ADHD because I'm telling you, I'm pretty sure probably we all had it. So it just looked like the norm. You know what I mean? Like it didn't, it wasn't anything out of the norm. But when I got diagnosed and when I told my mom, she was like, oh, okay, well, good. You know, like she did not at any at any point seem like it was a shameful thing or was ashamed of it or or felt like it wasn't real. She was just like, okay, well, that's great. You know, that can maybe that can help you. And and I, I do remember like there was a, a point where we like 
I don't know what happened, but I didn't have like insurance for a little while. And uh, the medication, for some reason, the extender release was so expensive. It was like $150 or something. And I was like, well, we'll pay it, whatever you need to function. You know, this is your med. And so it's just so weird how when you see it working, like you're going to do whatever it takes for your kid to do whatever it takes, you know? Yeah, no, that's wonderful. So they were very supportive once you actually had a diagnosis. Right, right. And I, w- I was going to say, like, it, it was never, even though I said I did well in medical school, it was obviously never rainbow and daisies. Like, I had to work to finish, you know, like, and um, and I didn't pass my first uh, exam for to become a doctor. There's There's exams that you have to take, like, they call it STEPs. They call it step one, step two, step three. And you it doesn't matter if you completed all your four years of medical school and you passed all your rotations. If you don't pass those tests, like you cannot become a doctor. And so the very first test that I took, like I didn't pass that exam. I missed it by one point, oh. one point. <laughs> oh. And and then, you know, I took it maybe like three to four weeks after my dad had passed away. And I did end up asking my school, and actually my school suggested that I split my first year into two years. So I kind of, you could say my medical school first year was considered part-time because I was flying home so much. So it ended up taking me five years to graduate, you know, versus most people would have graduated in four. And so I didn't pass that test. And, you know, most people would just retake it and be done with it. Oh, not me. I was like, no, I'm going to take out a loan on top of my loan. I'm going to go to Chicago to do a special program. I'm going to be all in for this thing. I'm going to pass this test. And in my mind, if I went to like a different part of the country, like the system was not going to be rigged. So many weird things that your brain tells you, right? Like in my mind, no, we're in Houston. So in Houston, you have too many doctors here. Like they're driving up the course up. I'm going to go somewhere else and I'm going to, you know. Your brain tells you all kinds of silly things. Anyways, so I went to take this test and I passed. And, you know, then, of course, I took the second and the third and it was fine. And now I even took the board certification for family medicine, which is a test that you have to do every 10 years. And I passed. But I always passed like burly pass. But I was like, you know what? This is my best. I don't care. Like the grade on the wall does not define my bedside manner. Like I stopped allowing grades to determine like who I was as a person you know a lot of us have that like we feel like the higher the grade the better you are but you know you're worthy because you were born you don't have to prove anything to anybody and it it took a while and I you know I started embracing the C still equals MD (laughs) 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 so C equals still equals MD (laughs) it does you know it does (laughs) And that is so funny, but it's so true. All you have to do is just get through it. I mean, that's what I tell my son. You know, he's at his, um, he just started his second semester of his first year at NYU during COVID. And I'm like, I don't care if you eke by, you know, with C's. Yeah. That's cool. You will graduate. You will, you know, you will be able to say you went to NYU. Yeah. I completely agree. Just pass. Right. And, and you know, there were days that I, as a physician, that I was like feeling bad that I didn't remember everything and this and that. And then like somebody pointed out and then they asked me, so what do you do when you don't remember everything? And I'm like, well, I tell the patient, they're right here in front of me. I tell them, I don't know exactly what you're saying, but it sounds like this. And like on the fly right there, I'm logging into up to date and looking it up and I'm showing them pictures and I'm figuring it out. And they're like, but you still figure it out. And I'm like, yeah, but it takes me all this They're like, so what if that just means you're thorough? What if it just means you're not telling yourself you know everything and you know you have some limitations and you know where to start looking and you don't have to know everything right there in the one minute, like a standardized test where you have one minute to answer. Like the patient is not going to need the answer in one minute. They're going to need their answer eventually and whatever, you know, is critical, you send to the ER. And and that's what my role is to figure out what 
is going to kill you right this second. What do I have time to figure it out? And where can I bring a specialist so we can figure it out together, you know? And so I think having ADHD and knowing that we can't remember everything is a good thing because our brain doesn't care that you have, it's not meant to keep a list of things to do. The brain is supposed to process things. And so if you ask the brain a question, it will spit out an answer, you know? And so I think that having ADHD as a physician is important because you don't have to remember everything. You just have to know where to go look, you know? Well, what you're saying is you're creative. You know, you're willing to take in all of these sources and ideas and comments from the patients and put it all together into something that if all you can do is memorize and spit information out and think that you know everything, how can that be a good medical professional, right? Right. No, it, it makes perfect sense to me. Okay. One last question for you, Diana. a question I always ask. What is your number one ADHD workaround? So my workaround is having compassionate for others. But I think my most important one now, which is really blowing it out of the park, is my self-care. Because when I take care of me, then I can show up and be present for others from a place of abundance, not from a place of like, I don't have enough time. That makes perfect sense to me. And you're not blowing through it. You're really in it and taking the time and understanding what your value is, right? And then what comes from that is then so much better than if you just kind of blew through it and tried to, am I making sense? Yes, because, you know, I used to, the way I, I would, I was always behind on my notes, okay? I was like prior to three months or whatever, I always had like 80 to 90 notes open like in a month or something. And and it seems like a lot, but when you see 20 patients a day, you know, if you just have a bad day where things, they add up, you know? But what somebody taught me was that if I just do one note at a time, like see the patient, do the note, see the patient, do the note. And I didn't think I could do that because I felt like I was making the patient wait, right? They told me, no, but when you actually do that, when you show up for the next patient, you don't have that tab open. You're fully present. So even if the tab's not open in your brain too, right? Exactly. Exactly. Now you can really listen to their story instead of be so worried about the previous note because, you know, we... Our short-term memory works best at that time. If I try to recreate the note, I realized it would take me like 10, 15 minutes versus four minutes, you know? So I started getting creative and using timers and, and I started telling my staff, hey, I don't have an internal timer. Can you please come just knock on my door? <laughs> and you don't have to tell me anything You in that if the patient asks, I'm just going to tell them that I don't have an internal timer. I'm just trying to, you know, uh, be mindful. And then I don't have to get up at that moment, but at least I'm aware. And so that has helped me a lot. No, nope. that makes perfect sense to me. So where can women find you if they'd like to connect? Sure. So I was, like you just mentioned, I just started life coach school. So of course I have all this new thinking that I'm doing. So if they have any questions about, you know, how to do any workarounds or if they want me to mentor them for uh, going into any medical field, they can reach me at overachieve with ADHD at gmail.com. Over, wait, overachieve with, with ADHD. ADHD. At gmail.com. At gmail.com. Perfect. Wonderful. Well, Diana, thank you so much for spending time with us here today. That was really fun. I knew it would be. I just really appreciate hearing your story. And I'm sure our listeners do too. Thank you. So that's what I have for you for this week. And if you like this episode with Diana, did I call you Diana again? No, oh my you, gosh. You got uh, it right. I, I, I got it right. Okay. If you like this episode with Diana, please let us know by leaving a review. 
Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their amazing strengths. And your reviews, they really help in that regard. One more thing, if you have a comment, a guest you'd like me to interview, or a topic idea for this podcast, you can go to my website at tracyoutsuka.com and leave me a message there. And if you want to join me for my free five-day workshop, How to Fall in Love with Your ADHD Brain, you can join the wait list at tracyoutsuka.com forward slash I love my brain. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is a OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.